Good morning. I'm Howard Nations, and uh, as you know, I am uh, co-lead counsel on your case. Uh, we have your other attorneys on the phone with us, several of our attorneys uh, on this call. And we're going to be doing something different today. Finally, after several of these that I've done, we're going to get to talk about your case. We finally got through all the mechanisms and procedures and the court and all that sort of thing. So I'm happy to report. Well, first of all, let me give you a little uh, clarification uh, of truth to set aside a lot of what you're still hearing on television. Just so you're not confused, there is no settlement offer in this case. There has never been a settlement offer in this case. The Department of Navy never offered one penny to anybody. They shoved those cases through, or they didn't shove them through, they just sat on them, but nothing was ever done there in settlement. The Department of Justice has never offered a penny in settlement. So all this that you're hearing on TV about how much money has been set aside for settlement, the federal government has set aside nothing or a settlement. That was a lie. That was a lie that came out on the day this bill was signed. The So what we have is you have an individual lawsuit against the United States government for the damage done to you by their gross misuse of the toxins that caused your injury. What we're going to talk about today, first of all, I want to explain the system. Since you're finally getting into the system, I want to explain the system and how we will get to the point where we will talk about your case and evaluate your case and negotiate your case and settle your case or try your case. So I want you to understand the system that goes into that. So first of all, we start with the... Um, we start with the court. Where we are today in the court is great because the court, after a year, um, has established a leadership. Uh, our leadership has established committees. Uh, the committees are each doing their individual work, and things are rolling very rapidly right now. So we finally have control, and we're moving forward. And this is good news for, for all of us. Right now, we're still setting up protocols and procedures for how we're going to handle uh, all this massive amount of litigation. But your cases for evaluation will be coming into it very shortly. Now, the Navy JAG is a major problem in this case. And uh, you had to file your administrative claim first with the Navy. The Navy was supposed to see about settling as many of these cases as they, they could. The Navy JAG never made a penny of offer. They never attempted to negotiate. They never set up a, a mechanism for negotiation. So we moved on through Navy JAG to the extent that we can. The problem is they also are, are so backed up. They have they've gotten a total of less than 100 cases that are filed with Navy JAG, but the, the number they've actually put through is very small. And they're just, they're basically just incompetent. And they have no interest in ever doing settlement negotiations in these cases. But we have to go through there. So uh, we're putting your cases through. We, uh, we fortunately were uh, in the group in leadership that was started putting our cases through uh, right away. Now we get more cases in. We keep putting them through. So our, our situation right now is if Navy JAG has less than 100,000 cases, there are estimated to be, with pretty pretty much accuracy, about 400 to 450,000 cases. That means they're going to have another 350,000 cases file, to file uh, in the administrative claims uh, between now and August 10th of next year. So somewhere along about June of next year, in July and August, there's going to be a quagmire at the administrative claim level of Navy JAG that unlike anything you've ever seen, they couldn't handle in, in a year's time. They can't handle the cases that have been filed already. And there's three and a half times more cases than that that are yet to be filed. So our goal is to get in and out of Navy JAG as quickly as we can. We file them as soon as 
as soon as we can get through there. And uh, we're doing that as efficiently as possible. Uh, then we go into Navy JAG. And Navy JAG is, uh, I'm sorry, but then we go into the Department of Justice. And once we come out of, of Navy JAG, we your cases can just sit there after they've gone through, uh, after they've gone through the Navy, they can either just sit there or they can be filed, filed with the Department of Justice. Now, we are very careful on what we're filing. And when I say we, I'm talking about the group of us. We formed together a group very early in this, very early in this process. We were the first ones to file cases uh, out of the first uh, 100 cases filed. Uh, 98 of them were ours in our group. Uh, we had everything ready to go, filed them, filed them on uh, midnight, 12.01 uh, a.m. And so we're the first ones before the Navy uh, before, and the first ones before the Department of Justice. So we currently have cases pending in the Department of Justice in, in the court, which gives us the authority to deal with the judges. So we've been dealing with the judges. We've been dealing with the Department of Justice for this first year. And now we finally have a lot of procedures in place with the courts. Now we're turning to uh, putting procedures in place with the Department of Justice on stipulations and uh, things of that nature that will move this thing faster through the, uh, through the Department of Justice and through the courts. Uh, what we're aiming to, during that period of time, if your case is on file, You'll be answering interrogatories. You'll be asking, answering a, a lot of questions. You may be called uh, for deposition, but it's it's probably unless you are a bellwether case, you're not going to be called anytime soon for a deposition, and you odds are that you'll never be called for a deposition. But so, what we're doing right now is choosing bellwether cases. Bellwether cases are those cases that we're going to submit to the court that we want to try and be the first cases to try. The purpose of the Bellwether case is to get into trial, get a jury verdict on the value of the cases, let a jury tell us what, what they think those cases are worth. We have uh, 10 different Tier 1 cases. We're going to try uh, those Tier 1 cases uh, as rapidly as we can, uh, and so as to get a value on each of them. Now, at the same time, we're on a two-track system. We're going to be, we have one track that's moving through to trial. And we have the other track that simultaneously is moving through uh, to mediation or settlement. And that trial, that group will be working on a matrix. And a matrix is an evaluation tool so they can take, say, all the kidney disease cases uh, put them together uh, and then plug them, plug them in the boxes where they fit. You put in the the, uh, the particular uh, damages that this person has and all the things about him into that box and it and and it's set up in such a way that you get so many points for each uh, type of injury or so forth and then you put a dollar value on that and that's that's a mechanism that we try to use for evaluating uh, all of our cases. Then we'll be evaluating once we get the matrix in place, and hopefully we'll be creating the matrix with the Navy. I mean, with the uh, uh, with the Department of Justice, rather. Uh, we'll be creating a matrix with them so that we agree on the matrix. When we agree on the matrix, then we can then we can start plugging in cases and start looking at serious uh, serious settlement talks. So the uh, but the bellwether cases then are the ones that are chosen for trial. And the courts have told us, this is very interesting, the courts have told, you, told us, we'll give you all the trials you want. We'll give you one-day trials. Everybody's going to, you'll, you'll get as many one-day trials as you want. Well, in that, the court is presuming that we're not going to have a jury. Uh, that's not going to be the case. We're going to demand jury. We, we ask for a jury in every one of these cases because we want, we want to hear what the jurors think of these cases. It's, it's extremely important to us. And then we take the information we get from trying the cases, the bellwether cases, and we apply that over to the matrix 
uh, and try to find standard values that fit for certain types of injuries. And then we have all the different, we have all the different boxes and uh, of injuries within the kidney disease, for example. And then you get credit, you get credit for each one. And then you can come out with a total at the end. But that starts with our bellwether trials. And it starts with us establishing establishing values by hearing what juries that jurors think of this case. And that's one reason that there hadn't been any settlement uh, talks so far, because there's a great disparity between what we think of your case and what the Department of Justice thinks of your case. And so we'll, we'll get some, we will try three or four of each of the 10, uh, well, uh, each of the 10 uh, tier one cases and get four or five different juries to tell us that they think kidney disease is worth this amount of money and so forth. And then we can take all that, put it into the matrix and start negotiating. Um, so matrix are gonna be the first things up. The, uh, and on, the, on that side, they're starting to put in the boxes now. And that's already being worked on to put in what are the elements of a, of a kidney disease, for example. Uh, and then at the same time over on our side, we haven't gotten our first cases in. I'm on the bellwether side on the trial track and we haven't gotten our first bellwethers in, but what we're doing is we're having our, the lawyers, if a lawyer thinks they have a bellwether case that's ready to go, ready to be tried, they write it up for us, they send it to us, we review it, we discuss it with plaintiff and so forth, and then we decide, that, yes, this would be a great bellwether case, we put it forward to the court uh, and to the DOJ, and then we see if we can get a bellwether trial. Uh, we have, we're, we're just now sending out requests to the, all of the attorneys as if you think you have a bellwether case, write it up and send it to us so we can get started with these trials. Um, the judges are anxious to try cases and we can try a jury trial in two days. Uh, and so, it, and we get four judges trying uh, two day trials. We can move through uh, the, what we need for bellwether trials uh, very quickly. And start, and then start filling in. Go over to the other side. Start filling in the information on the matrix, and try to put values on the matrix. So that's that's the procedure. So uh, so when you say uh, what's happening to my case, well, odds are uh, you're either in the Navy J administrative process which is a waste of time, but you have to go through there. You're either in there waiting for them to push it out or waiting for 60 days to go up and then we'll, we'll take it out. And you're sitting outside the door of the courthouse uh, uh, waiting for us to uh, pick our best cases as we've already got 2000 cases filed and then to start. And you may never, you may never get filed. You may never need to be filed because We'll take those bellwether cases that we get and verdicts in there, and then we'll, we'll apply it to the matrix, and then you'll be in that, and then we'll, uh, we'll, we'll do an evaluation of your case uh, in the context of all the other uh, kidney disease cases, for example. Uh, and then we apply in-house at our office uh, and with, your, uh, with our co-counsel. We will take it take a case from the matrix and, and then we will apply our individual knowledge of the damages in that case to what the matrix uh, spits out. So they may say, well, the matrix would put this at X number of dollars and we'll say, no, it's X number of dollars. You didn't get the matrix, didn't consider this. It's X number of dollars plus this factor, this factor. We'll do an individual evaluation on this, uh, your case. And that's where we go with the, uh, with negotiation on it. So uh, the, the damages uh, is something now I wanna to talk to you about because this is where, this is for your benefit. So you understand how this whole system uh, works and you can think it through in terms of how does this apply to my individual case. So let me give you an example. Uh, in this new proposal that's being made by the Department of Justice, 
they put exactly the same value on every, every disease. They do not distinguish between them. So I want to tell you how you're supposed to, how, how we distinguish between these in court and how uh, not only are all disease, kidney disease cases are not the same, very few of them are even very similar. I've, I've never seen, I've been doing these for 56 years. I've never seen one docket where every single case is so individualized. You often have, you'll often have uh, catastrophes where everybody has the same consequence. They're, they're all burned or something of that nature. This is so many, so many different toxins, uh, so many different people for such a different period of time. Each one of these cases is so different from the other, They're highly individualized. So it's very important that, that you be able to help us do this evaluation on your case because your case needs to be distinguished from everybody else's. So let me give you a sample. You know, this is a good example of, of a real case, actually. Uh, the kidney disease case. We have a very fine man who goes into the Marine Corps. Uh, he serves uh, He serves a career. He, he comes out and he is wounded. He's had... Uh, He's got three Purple Hearts in his service. Um, and he was a, when he, he racked, finished up as a master sergeant. And then when he came out, he, he was, he was uh, diagnosed with kidney disease. So his kidney disease went to stage two, stage three, stage four, goes into end stage renal failure. All right, in-stage renal or in-stage renal disease, same thing. Uh, then at that point, he has to start worrying about going, going on dialysis. So going on dialysis is a huge expense. I mean, unbelievable expense. Uh, and going on dialysis, in some cases, you have to go to a dialysis center uh, three or four times a week, depending on what your doctor says. And you have to spend three or four hours uh, dialysis really destroys any order to your life because when you're on dialysis, the, the doctors will put you on three days a week or four days a week uh, or three hours at a time or four hours at a time in extreme cases. But you have to take, just think about this. Let me tell you what the elements of damage are and you think about how those apply to this situation. The elements of damage that you're entitled to recover for, none of which, none of which are considered in the in the grid that is offered by the uh, that's going to be offered by the Department of Justice. The elements of damage that we tell a jury they should consider in making an award are physical pain, mental anguish, physical disability, physical disfigurement, economic loss, damage to wage earning capacity. And, and medical expenses. And then there's some always some extraordinary expenses. Uh, but that's what you're supposed to, that's what a jury will be told in your case. That's what a jury will be told to consider in assessing your damages. What the DOJ says are only two things. One is what, what, disease, uh, what disease do you have if you have one of the nine magic diseases? And two, how long were you were at Camp Lejeune? That's all they considered. They don't consider anything about the things I just told you about, but I want you to now. Now, so think about that for this for this master sergeant. Physical pain, mental anguish, physical disability, physical disfigurement, damage to wage earning capacity, economic loss, and medical expenses. Now, he goes into dialysis. So he gets a, a he gets a three-hour regimen three days a week. So three days a week, he has to go plug up to a machine and sit there for three hours. And it's the whole hour, the whole process, by the time you finish it, it runs an hour. By the time you get in, get plugged in, get, and that's, and that's just three hours of exchanging your blood. But then you have to do that again a couple of days later, and you have to do it three times a week. Some people have to do it four times a week. But 
every time you try to plan your life, you you look at it's time for another dialysis. If you want to go out of town uh, for more than a day, you have to arrange for dialysis where you're going out of town. I mean, it just it just it rules your life. Uh, also, people have adverse reactions to uh, to dialysis. It, it weakens them so that when they finish three hours of it, they're so weak. They're kind of shot for the rest of the day. Think about the mental anguish, the physical pain, the physical disability involved in that. All right. So then this man goes through that and he's on dialysis for four years. Um, and at about five years, it gets you start running out of the ability to have dialysis. Uh, and dialysis does hurt the kidneys. I mean, there's no question it has to, but it also keeps you alive. And it keeps you alive while you're waiting to get a, a kidney transplant. So you got all this mental anguish about how am I going to, at my age, how am I going to get a, a, a kidney? Who's going to, I'm too old, I can't qualify for a kidney transplant. But this gentleman finally did. He got a family member uh, and they gave him, they gave him a, a kidney. And then after that, I mean, that's, that's a treacherous operation, especially at the age that uh, this gentleman was getting it. And uh, then you have the mental anguish about, uh, is this kidney going to work? Uh, or is the, the uh, next year and a half, uh, you got to worry, is my, is my body going to reject this kidney? So you have to worry about rejection, big problem. And the older you are, the more you have to worry about rejection. And so that is that is daily mental anguish. If you make it to about 18 months, you're you're kind of you're closer to home free. So he makes it through and then he dies, and he did not die from uh, anything related to the kidney disease. Now, you give think about you're you're a juror, just put your mindset in it, you're a juror. And you just heard this case. And then the judge asked you to put a value on what that gentleman went through. The judge asked you to consider how much pain did he have? How much mental anguish did he have? Physical disability, physical disfigurement, uh, wage loss, damage to wage earning capacity. Uh, and they ask you to put a value on that case. Now, just for yourself, we've done this with focus groups and I know what it comes out, but just for yourself right now, think about, think in your mind, what would you even think about awarding that gentleman to compensate for all that he went through, uh, dialysis for four years, uh, the fear, and the, the, he, was, he was fortunate. He was one of the ones that got a kidney transplant and his kidney transplant worked, but he had, to, he had a year and a half of overwhelming uh, mental anguish while he's going to find out if it's going to work for him or not. So uh, now think in your own mind, how much would you, how much would you award in a case like that? Well, you say, well, I don't know anything about that. Well, neither do the jurors, except the jurors would have a, would have a, uh, a, a lawyer making a closing argument, suggesting to them how much they, now I'm not going to suggest to you how much that's worth, but let me just ask you, is that, is that case in your mind, worth a million dollars? Is it worth $150,000? Is it worth $2 million? Is it worth $3 million? Is it worth, what is it worth? Just think to yourself what a range is, okay? Now let's talk about another, let's talk about another uh, kidney disease case. Young man goes in the Marine Corps, he serves, uh, he, he's at Camp Lejeune, goes to Paris Island, then goes to Camp Lejeune. In Camp Lejeune, he gets in an administrative position that he really likes. So he stays there. He, sign, he renews, signs up for it, re-enlists. So he ends up spending six years at Camp Lejeune. At, at that time, he got out of Camp Lejeune. And then uh, a few years later, he is diagnosed as, as end-stage renal failure. There are not a lot of symptoms in kidney disease uh, before, before you get to end stage renal failure. So he didn't go to doctors often and that sort of thing. Didn't really keep close, close watch on his health. But he he gets um, he he gets in he gets diagnosed with end stage renal failure, and two months later he's killed in an automobile accident. 
Now, those that's two kidney disease cases. Now think, what are his damages compared to the sergeant's damages? The, his damages, he didn't even know he had renal disease until he was diagnosed finally with end-stage renal failure. That was his first diagnosis, was end-stage renal failure. And two months later, he died. So he didn't have the mental anguish of knowing all that, uh, of all those years of knowing he's got end-stage renal failure. Uh, he, he never had the dialysis. He never had to worry about a heart, a, a kidney transplant. Uh, and really from a viewpoint, his, his physical pain, it wasn't that much, mental anguish, physical disability, those things were greatly reduced because he only had two months of knowledge that he even had uh, end-stage renal failure. Now, what is that case worth? Are those two cases same old, same old, as they say in Korea? Uh, those are two kidney disease cases. So you see, all kidney disease cases are not the same. They're very different. But then I want you to look at, we'll look at this, we'll come back to this example when, when we get to the uh, DOJ's uh, grid at the end. So uh, the next thing is your damages. I want you to, to take that, take that example and think in terms of your case. What is your physical pain with your disease? And what do you, how do you, how does it manifest itself? Is there a particular spot or is it, how does it, is it, is it just an ache all over your body? Think about your, your physical pain because when we get down to evaluating your particular case for diagnosis, I mean, for, for evaluation, uh, and especially if they take your deposition, this is what you're going to be asked. You're going to be asked about your pain. And you're going to be asked to describe your pain. And you're going to be asked what parts of your body did you, did you have pain? And how often did you have it? What did you take for it? Did you take Tylenol? Did, you have, did your doctor put you on opioids? Think about pain. And it's a good idea. Uh, I'm not going to tell you it's required to do this, but it's certainly a good idea to keep a diary. Just keep a diary of this pain and find, just think for it to yourself as you keep your diary. Okay, where is my pain? How often do I have it? How intense is it on a scale of one to 10 uh, with a one being the worst and 10 being, and so forth. And then you go through the same thing. What mental language do I have? And there's so many different kinds. I mean, the, the fact that you have physical pain causes you mental anguish. So you're very involved uh, there uh, just from having the pain. Now, there's also the mental anguish that you have, and there's all sorts of mental anguish that accompany uh, disabilities. Uh, and so make a record of the type of, you can't sleep at night. You can't, you, uh, what type of problems do you have for your mental anguish, what are the things that you can't do that you could do before you got this disease? That's one way to look at it. List, make a list of the things you used to love to do. You used to play golf all the time, go fish, whatever. And then make a list, of, check off how many of those can you no longer do? And what's, what is your mental anguish uh, about that? Uh, so go through physical pain, then mental anguish, Physical disability means the things that you used to could do that are not, that were not part of your job, that were not to create money, but just that you enjoy doing, uh, that you can no longer do. So physical, uh, physical disability in some states is uh, referred to as loss of enjoyment of life. Uh, but what are the things you used to do that you love to do that you can't do anymore? Um, so, uh, then, then make a record of that just, and, and have it ready. Uh, and then physical disfigurement would be if you've been, if you've had a lot of surgeries or if you, you were reflected that you have a lot of scars as a result of whatever your disease is. Um, and some carry more surgeries than, than others. Uh, so then also keep a record. One of the most effective things I, I saw in a trial one time was had a lady was 
she took 13 different prescriptions a day uh, because of this malpractice that caused her thyroid condition, bad thyroid condition. And it required her to take 13 pills a day. And this went on for years. She kept every prescription bottle she had, every prescription bottle. And she put them in a big, a big trash bag and she brought them to court. And she said, this is how much medication I've had. And she wanted to dump them on the floor. <laughs> and I, I wouldn't quite, I wouldn't go along with that because I know the judge wouldn't have, but just holding up a big trash bag of small prescription bottles just to show how much prescription she had to take as a result of this malpractice. It was very, it was very powerful. Um, and then keep up with your medical, uh, be absolutely do, sure to do this, just because it's such a pain if you, if you try to remember it. Keep a list of every doctor that you go to and what, what that doctor treats you for, what was the purpose. And, and then we have, because you'll have to tell us who your doctors are. We have to go back and get the records and figure out if they apply, if they apply to this. So all your prescriptions and, and all of your uh, medical records uh, and, and keep up with what that doctor, just generally, what were they treating? What was the diagnosis? Um, because that comes down to medical testimony and medical testimony is what makes your case. I mean, it absolutely makes your case is the doctor, you can say uh, that this hurts and all that, but it's far better to say she's bound to be having pain for this. She's bound, she has mental anguish, she has this and this, and you testify to it and the doctor verifies it. And the doctor can verify it much better uh, if you can remember it. And if you, and in addition, if you were hospitalized a lot, you wanna keep the, record the name of your nurses because the nurses actually make the best witnesses on pain and suffering, mental language and so forth when you're in the hospital, because they're the ones that are with you all the time. And they're the ones that are getting you through the physical pain and the mental anguish and that sort of thing. So keep up with your, with your, uh, with your doctors and your nurses. And then, so just record all these things as you go. So when, when I get you in the office and I say, okay, let's talk about your damages. And you pull out that, you pull out your notebook and say, well, let's see. I say, aha, somebody listened. You're in such a better shape than if you come into my office and I say, okay, let's talk about your damages. Tell me about your mental anguish. And you're like, well, I'm having mental anguish right now. Uh, so anyway, that's damages. And that's what you can do about your own damages, about recording your own damages, and but mainly re recording your all of your healthcare providers and your prescriptions and that sort of thing. And uh, let me just mention one thing that doesn't doesn't really um, one thing that doesn't really pertain directly to to this. But when we're talking about things to do, be absolutely sure that you have a will that appoints uh, an administrator, executor, or whatever, because, I mean, we're all getting old and we're getting, uh, and, and some of us aren't going to make it through this whole litigation. And so if that happens, if you don't have a will, uh, it's a mess. We have, but if you have, if you have a will, uh, then you have an administrator appointed who can come in and take action immediately and things move very rapidly. Uh, you come in with no, no administrator. We may have to go to Montana to get an administrator appointed. Uh, and, and it's just, uh, it's just a better thing besides the fact that you get your, you get your say on what happens, but you want to give that, you want that administrator to have the authority to file a suit in your behalf. That's the whole idea. And that speeds things up. Nothing speeds things up as quickly as that, as having a, a legal representative already qualified uh, to, to deal in your behalf. Uh, the, uh, so let me just say at this point, um, if you want, I'm going to have a question and answer session at the end. But if you have any questions about 
what we've covered already, not about the things we haven't gotten to yet, but about what we've covered already, uh, just use the chat, put a, uh, you show them where the chat is. Uh, Brittany. Uh, yes, the chat or the question and answer is at the bottom of the screen. And they can type, I believe they can type in the question and answer field would be the easiest. Okay. And so you you put up the chat, we'll see it, we'll, we'll see the questions over here and uh, we'll answer, uh, we'll answer what we haven't already answered and uh, or what we're not going to uh, reach in the future. So, uh, and then we'll have a, depending on the amount of time we have left, we'll have a bigger discussion about this uh, with question and answer at the end. So uh, if you have questions as you go, just put put it put on the chat line. Okay, so you've heard about the big news, Wednesday. Um, you've, you've probably heard advertising that the DOJ settled a case, made a settlement offer this week, and everybody's all excited about it. And the, well, what happens on that is that you see all the advertising on TV. It is grossly misleading. Every ad you see that talks about a settlement uh, is a lie, but you see them over and over and over. I saw one the other day with a picture of a man who said this Marine sergeant just received $250,000 for his, for drinking toxic water. And we had a picture of a man in there with just a blatant lie. He has not received, nobody has received 250,000. Uh, so be aware of that. But what has happened, I saw the advertising saying, DOJ has settled the Camp Lejeune cases. What, what happened is we were sitting in a, a leadership meeting Wednesday in Raleigh and we got a call, it was quarter 12 and we got a call from the, uh, from Bain, the, the head, head guy at DOJ. And he said, okay, we're doing a press release at noon. And we want to give you a heads up. We'll send it to you. We're doing a press release. Uh, and we're going to, we're doing a, a uh, proposing a grid. And said, uh, so, okay, fine. So they sent it over to us. We looked at it. And then we went back to work on what we were working on. The um, uh, we were not concerned about it. We we did an analysis through it went because it was very predictable. Now, let me tell you. Let me tell you why that grid came out from the Department of Justice. What they were trying to accomplish in that grid is three things. The judges expressed anger, to put it mildly, and rage. I'm not kidding. The judges were very mad at DOJ. We had a meeting with the court on April 9th, and the court asked uh, Mr. Bain, uh, how many cases have you settled so far? And he said, none, Your Honor. And he said, well, how many has the Department of Navy settled. And he said, none, Your Honor. And Judge Dever, he said over the rest of the hearing we had, he just interjected eight times. We counted. He, he interjected, I cannot believe that the Navy has not settled one single case. I cannot believe that. And they were mad about it. And the reason they were mad was this. The reason you go through the administrative claim before you can go to court is because it gives the Navy the opportunity to settle cases. And that's their job, to try to settle cases and eliminate them so they don't have to take up the time of the federal judges by pushing the cases forward into trial. When he found out that not one case had been settled by DOJ, that meant there was no filter before it gets to him. And they were very upset because they had already heard, they had heard at the time that there were 400,000 cases. And he was, they were, 
they were just sort of relying on the Navy JAG to eliminate 250 of them, maybe 250,000. And so the DOJ had to, had to respond in some way. And they're not, they're not responding, uh, hadn't responded. So this was their response. Now, let me explain to you. Uh, they, the D, I'm not criticizing the DOJ. The DOJ is being excellent in how they are cooperating with us. And they're cooperating with us on the tier one cases. And we'll show you what the tier one cases are in just a minute. But they're cooperating. And, and this is, I think this is very important because I've said all along that the DOJ is only going to pay, they're only going to settle cases that are tier one, that meet the ethical, I mean, meet the, uh, the standards for an expert, experts who can come in and testify to the science supporting the proposition that your disease has been tied scientifically to the toxin to which you were exposed, that there is it is as likely as not that the toxin to which you were exposed has was has a connection to your disease. And without that, I think Bain expressed early this proposition. He said the if you come in and you have a tier one case then we will, we're going to negotiate with you if you can make, if you can make uh, specific causation, we'll negotiate with you. We'll make you a good faith offer. And if you think, if you think it's enough, fine. If uh, you don't, we'll go try the case and, and, and get it done, get it done, get it disposed of. But if you come in and you don't have the science supporting your claim, and you can't pass Daubert, which means your expert has the science and he's qualified to testify to it. If you can't do that, we're not going to pay you. He said, my job is to protect the taxpayer's money. And my job is to protect the United States Treasury. He said, so we don't give away money around here. If you can prove your case, we'll pay you either in settlement or in judgment. So it becomes extremely important that the fact that DOJ is cooperating with us fully, stipulations and so forth, on the tier one cases. Uh, and then the other cases we're going to, I'll talk to you about that in just a moment. So what, let me talk about how your case has to go through the system now. We file it in Navy. We we wait. It's over there six months. If they haven't done it in six months, if they haven't do, dealt with it in six months, which they haven't, then we can move on out. We have 180 days there. We go from there. We can then we're then qualified to move into federal court and file a case in the Eastern District of North Carolina. File an individual lawsuit of you versus. United States government. Now we, we haven't gotten to this yet, but we think we're, we're going to get to the point. One reason we haven't filed everything uh, is because I think we're going to get to the point where we're going to ask the court to allow us to bundle cases and bundling cases means that we can, we can put 200, 200 cases in one pleading and the filing fee is $400. So if we, if we have to file every case individually, there are tens of thousands, there are hundreds of thousands of cases. You're talking about millions and millions of dollars just in filing fees. But if we can bundle 200, 200 cases, we can do 200 cases for $400. So, uh, we're, but we haven't gotten that in. They haven't gotten, that hadn't been presented to the court yet. So we're holding back. A lot of people are holding back on filing which we want them to do, but we're holding back on filing until we get to the point where we can file, if we need to, if we ever need to, where we can file cases 200 at a time. 
we don't want to do that now. We want to keep it. We're in control of what's being filed. We and we're filing tier one cases. And if nobody else, if if somebody comes in and and files a a case that's not qualified, then when they're picking bellwethers, the Navy gets to choose a bellwether. We get to choose a bellwether. Then they come in and choose the one that they know they can win because there's no science on it. But they can only do that if that case is on file. And if somebody who doesn't know any better files that case, if we keep if we keep filing cases that are only tier one, then they have nothing to choose from but tier one cases. So that keeps us in, in, in we want to stay in control. That's why there's not a lot of people falling all over themselves to file cases. So if you want to know why your case is not on file, it's because you're represented by the other cases that we put on file early where we the people that have your same disease. We we filed we started filing cases on the first night that you could do it. And so we have most of the cases on file and you're represented by a bellwether case. So, but at any rate, if your case gets chosen, your, your case goes in, it's filed, it then goes through uh, the some routine processes. You have to file a plenty fact sheet, and then they'll ask you to send you interrogatories. This is where you have to participate then, is when it's in court. You have to participate first with the, with the administrative claim, but then you have to participate in court. So then if you get in court, then you'll have to start, you'll file answers to interrogatories you require. Uh, uh, and then they may want your deposition. They may want your doctor's deposition. They may want your spouse's deposition and all that sort of thing. And that's really going to be unnecessary if we settle these things on a matrix the way we plan to. You won't have to, we're not going to take depositions on 450,000 people. So uh, it, then, but then if, if you're one of those going through, then your case, uh, say, I, I like your case and you're, it's a tier one and we're going to, they say, wow, this would be a great case. This, and I write up a, I write up a, a report on it and I send it to the Bellwether Committee where it comes to me, because that's where I am. That's one of my positions. And there's a group of us at the Bellwether Committee that will review that case. And then I, I may go do a focus group on your case uh, to establish that it would be a good a good Bellwether. And then we we submit, we, we decide within the Bellwether Committee which cases move on through to trial. And then as your case moves on through to trial, uh, I'd be working with you. We'd be working, I work with everybody that's going to trial. And we'd be working with you on focus groups. We'd be working with you on trial prep. We'd be working on you as a witness. We'd be working on establishing your story that you're going to tell in trial and carry you right on through, right on through. I work with the lawyer who's going to try your case uh, or try your case myself. And and we'll, we'll carry you right through the trial process and we'll do that with everybody that comes through into the, 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 uh, uh, into the bellwether block. And then there you go into, if you, you go in trial, you get a verdict. Okay. Your verdict goes go over to the matrix committee and they put that in there as, as, uh, to influence all the cases like yours. And, it becomes part of the part of the matrix. Now, you don't really need the matrix anymore because you have you have a verdict. We know what the jury thinks your case is worth. So there are some advantages to being the bellwether. Um, so the are uh, one of the bellwether cases. And since this, so after that, we, we we're going to work up a bellwether by disease. So we'll put all the all the disease, all the kidney disease cases will be will be put into a kidney disease matrix. All the leukemia cases will be put into a leukemia uh, matrix, and and then it moves through. And from there, that's where the that's where the settlement negotiation starts. Uh, and we we start trying to settle. We may try to settle, and this is one of the advantages of this this type of litigation. If we've got a, say we've got a, the court of uh, works, 
appoints a special master to work with us on all the kidney disease cases. And we're working with the Navy, uh, with the DOJ on one side, us on the other side, and the special master in the middle. And the job of the special master is to try to establish a matrix that everybody agrees to. And then we run the numbers through and we can settle every, every bellwether. We can settle every uh, kidney disease case we have in the matrix at one time, not for the same dollar amount, for the value of that case. And then we could go in and do one settlement and say, we got a, if we got a thousand cases in the matrix, we could do one matrix, one settlement that, that includes, that has a thousand cases settled uh, for a thousand different values. And then we could just take out the, the kidney disease cases uh, that, are, that are on file and move on through. And then we've got a matrix for settlement of all the cases. That same matrix applies to all the cases that are not, that are not on file. So without ever filing a lawsuit, your case will be settled as part uh, through the use of the matrix. Uh, and that's, that's how a lot of them are gonna be settled. Um, so, and then we'll do a different matrix. We'll do a matrix for each of the diseases, each of the, each of the, uh, uh, the tier one diseases, and then, uh, and then try to settle them uh, within that tier. Now, another way settlement occurs is if I go to the, I go to the, uh, DOJ and I talk to the head guy and I say, look, I want to settle my docket. My docket is prepared. It's ready to go. Every case I have is evaluated. I want to settle my docket. And then we can go to a mediator and sit down and work on my entire docket. I'm trying to settle every case at one time. That's another way it can happen. Um, uh, or it could happen that I go to the uh, I go to the head guy and say, "Look, all of my leukemia cases are ready to go. I've got them all. They're all supported. They're all they're all ready. I got everything you need for an evaluation. Let's go mediate them." And so he may say, "Okay." Uh, and we go to a mediator and we see if we can settle all my leukemia cases at one time. So there are a lot of ways this thing can get to settlement. Um, and there's one thing for sure, and that is that the Department of Justice uh, very definitely wants to settle these cases. Uh, they want to settle these cases. And by these cases, I mean the tier one cases. So <clears throat> I'm going to so at that point, that's that's just some of the ways this thing will go to settlement. Some, it could be that um, somebody's in a deposition and at the end of the deposition, the plaintiff's lawyer says, "We you got everything you need, let's, settle it. let's talk about settling that case. And then if the DA has the authority, if they decide they're gonna do that way, you could negotiate that one case that's not usually how it happens, but it could be that you negotiate that one case and get it settled. Uh, there are other situations where we're very aware of and we're keeping records on these in this fashion. And that is the, uh, we also have uh, people who are in extremists, which means that their life expectancy is, is not very long and that they, their life expectancy is so short that they're not likely to see the end of this litigation. In that case, we can go to court. There's a special provision. We can go to court and we can have our client's deposition taken uh, out of line uh, just to preserve their testimony. Now, uh, and then you can you can then go. If I take if I have ten people that I've got who have taken depositions on that on that basis that they're not expected to live very long. I could go to the DA and say, okay, I've got two, I've got 10 in extremist cases that are ready to evaluate. And I'd appreciate it if you would evaluate these separately for me and let's move on through and get these people paid. And uh, so there are a lot of ways that you can, that negotiation can, can happen but in something this big, 
uh, it has to start with trials. So we plan to try these cases and we plan to get the largest verdicts we can get and establish the value of these cases at a very high level. And, uh, and we'll do that. Now, the, you'll see what the DOJ has done uh, in, uh, in terms of their values. Uh, and so you have to you have to keep in mind you have to think of that versus what we can do uh, in the trial of these cases. Um, I will cover one more thing with you before I go into the DO, the DOJ grid, and that is this whole thing. Um, Brittany put up that first slide on let's talk about this whole thing about tier one cases because this is very important to both our analysis and to their analysis. Okay, go to the next. This. All right. So when when they say tier one cases, uh, and when we say tier one cases, there's a slight difference between us and we have exactly the same cases. We label them differently, and I'll tell you why. So the tier one cases, uh, I have uh, I have ten of them. The Department of Justice has ten of them. Uh, in my, my cases that I've been handling as tier one cases all the time, all the way through, are now the same ones that the, the very same ones that the uh, Department of Justice is using. So what this means, tier one means that uh, if you have uh, leukemia, okay, for example, and there are, and, and you, you were exposed, you can prove you were exposed to benzene. Then there are studies, these are scientific studies from 2006, 2013, 2010, 2011, 2012. So all these studies from years ago, all of which say that the science uh, establishes that exposure to benzene can cause leukemia. And the proof, the scientific proof, is sufficient to cause that. So that means that it's easy for us to put an expert witness on that can prove that benzene uh, causes leukemia. That's general liability. So they say, well, you know, we know this because this is done by ATSDR. ATSDR is a government organization and they're the ones doing all these studies, and these are findings of the ATSDR. So, so that's a government agency. So the government, when we're suing the government, the government agency says, hey, they got they got proof of general liability. So on those, they're not gonna, they're really not gonna fight us on that, on the general liability. Go to the second, show you the rest of them. The next slide. This is the first batch. Okay, the, the second batch is Parkinson's kidney disease, multiple myeloma, systemic sclerosis, or scleroderma. Okay, now notice the difference in these two. These are equipoise and above, and I sure don't want to get into that. Uh, but the other ones, go back to one. Go back, there you go. These are, the proof is sufficient. Now, what they say is they call these tier one where proof is sufficient. Go to the next one. They call these, they be in the Department of Justice, they call these tier two. And that's just so they can have an excuse to uh, to reduce the analysis. The fact is, we call them all tier one because all of these meets qualification. Tier one, tier two, all 10 of these meet the standard to move through. Uh, and it's a different standard, but it's still the same standard. It has the same legal effect that to move you right on through to the next issue. Now, the next issue is we still have to prove, for example, we, we know that we know that Parkinson's is equipoise, it, is, it can, can pass through the proof is there, scientific proof is there, but then we have, that's general liability. Then we have to prove specifically in your case that your Parkinson's was caused by your exposure to TCE. And so we're going to require specific proof. And this is where it involves your doctors. So when I say 
keep up with your your doctors that treated you, your doctors that uh, that that diagnosed you, and everything else. That's why it's so important that we will have to go back and prove the specifics of that. Okay, now does that mean that this is all they're going to pay? They're only going to cover these these ten diseases? Well, first of all, they decide arbitrarily, even though it's sufficient. Go go to the yeah, go back one. Uh, even though it's sufficient, they decide arbitrarily <laughs> that they're not going to pay major cardiac birth defects because there's so many of them, and so many things can happen. So we're just it's just too complicated. We'd have to investigate it. It's too much trouble. So we're not going to we're not going to pay these. <laughs> I mean, they're the highest level, but they're not. They say arbitrarily, we're, we're not going to settle these. Uh, so does that mean that and this is what I want you to understand. Does that mean if you're not on that list of 10 or nine, that you're not going to get paid in this case, that you're not going to, that you're not going to settle, they're not going to settle your case. Okay. Go down a couple of slides to there. Okay. I want you to notice this. Hepatic steatosis, lung cancer, which is a big one. We have huge numbers of cases come through as lung cancer, miscarriage. Um, and then, uh, neurobehavioral effects, um, and then we have female infertility. We have breast cancer. There is new study on male breast cancer, so that will qualify, but not female, uh, and esophageal cancer. Now, I want you to notice this. This is the important part. These are not qualified as tier one, which is based on ATSDR ratings, because ATSDR never rated them, you see? So if you go back and now there's two things going to happen here. Number one is ATSDR hadn't come out since 2017. For the last six years, there has been a massive amount of scientific study on this. So ATSDR is promising and promising and promising. And we are waiting and waiting and waiting for this very important thing, which is the new issue of ATSDR is going to be out this year, probably December 31st at midnight. But when the ATSDR comes out, they will reflect the additional studies from the last six years. It's entirely possible that the additional studies, they will now study lung cancer and it'll be a tier one. It's entirely possible, the same thing on hepatic steatosis, miscarriage, all of these. These were these uh, breast cancer and esophageal cancer. They found that they were below equipoise. Does that mean they're not sufficient? It means that science is not sufficient, but it doesn't mean there's no causation. Below equipoise can just mean there's not sufficient studies. There are not sufficient studies uh, to support the finding that it's a tier one. So that, that hole may be filled up, too, with the new ATSDR report in 23. So we're waiting for that. And as soon as it comes out, uh, we will apply it to your case. Uh, what's this? One more. Uh, go to the next. Okay. So this is the one where they say they found insufficient studies. That Not that it's below equipoise, not that it doesn't qualify, just that we can't say if it qualifies or not because there were not enough studies. So again, now there may be, and those are breast cancer. And like I say, Mayo has come out with new studies. So that one now qualifies. Uh, esophageal, some big cancers, esophageal cancer, brain cancer, CNS, prostate, pancreatic, which is a big one. Uh, I, I've got, I'm taking pancreatic cases, uh, even though they're not tier ones and rectal cancer. So what I'm saying is, if you're on this, uh, if you're on this list of the top 10, uh, then you're, you're a tier one case and you're in very strong position and you've got a good shot. You're gonna, you're gonna do well uh, at trial. You're gonna get through and you're gonna get to try your case or you're gonna be rated the highest at, uh, at settlement, in settlement negotiations. But that does not, that's not the, the ATSDR is not the end all and be all. The ATSDR 
can can upset the whole world uh, and probably will when it comes out this year. So that's what we're waiting for. So if if you have prostate cancer and you say, well, that's not a tier one or pancreatic cancer, and that's not a tier one, it may be that the ATSDR changes that completely uh, it just this year. So the other thing is there's another way to do it. There are about 11 different agencies like the American Cancer Institute and all these all these institutes that are doing studies. And I guarantee you there are studies of pancreatic cancer. So you can go get your own epidemiology. This is what I'm going to do. I'm taking pancreatic cancer because I believe this. I'm going to go get my own epidemiologist and get my own expert on pancreatic cancer. Let him review all the science about causation through benzene and let him come in as if it's a one-off case and go try a pancreatic cancer case by putting him on the stand, let him testify to the science and, and, and meet. And because we got a lower burden uh, now on this, thanks to the bill we passed, he only has to, we only have to prove that it's as likely as not that benzene, the exposure to benzene was a cause. There was a link between the exposure to benzene and the development of pancreatic cancer. So that's the other way you can do it. You can take you can take your own cases. You can create your own cases as if this whole thing's a one-off. And on the cases where the where the uh, where the sufficient damages, you know, you can afford to do that. So I'm 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 definitely taking pancreatic cancer and and we'll try as many as I need to. Okay. Uh, so that's hopefully by way of showing you don't give up. Is there one more? I think there's one more slide in there. Brittany? No, that's all for the injuries. That's fine. Okay. So let's stop for one minute and let me look at some questions here. I want them to come up over here, but I, that's okay. Let me let me look through these real quick. Uh, the once you get a judgment and your time, uh, your ju time runs out and your uh, your judgment is final, uh, you take it down to the uh, settlement fund at the United States Treasury, and they'll pay you within sixty days. Uh, Uh, let's see. Okay. Some of this I'm going to come to when we talk about this uh, in just a minute. So let me, some of these are going to be answered. So let me move on to the, let me move on to the Department of Justice grid. Um, so this is, this is what came out on Wednesday. Um, and the, the Department of Justice came out with this for three reasons. It is, they call it the, whoops, right there. Howard, do you want me to show you the? Yeah. Right. Okay. Now I got my, let me clear this up first. So the department came out and Hold on. No, this thing's trying to put me into a new meeting, and I really I really like this one. Um, I, I get onto my you on my, get on my screen, will you? Yeah, Brittany. Um, the the department came out with what is called the public guidance on elective option for Campus Union Justice Act claims. Now, the, uh, can you see me okay? Yes. Okay, then I don't need the screen. My screen's trying to put me into another, they must have somebody else giving a better speech. They want to, um, okay, so here's what happens. What they say is that we have this new thing called uh, an elective option. And the, ele uh, the elective option 
is for cases that are still pending administratively, which means that they're in the Department of Navy. They're, they're still pending at Navy JAG, or they haven't been through Navy JAG yet. Um, if you're newly filed with the Navy JAG, you can, you can qualify to try for the EO. You have to try for this. They refer to it as EO, which is their elective option. Um, so they say it's, first of all, it has to be like everything else. It's available, it's av available to certain claimants, qualifying claimants, who were at Camp Lejeune for 30 days. That's the first thing. The second thing is kind of advantageous to you if you're looking at this uh, to, to think about uh, accepting it. Uh, they've done away with the Department of Veterans Affairs liens uh, that, they, that they might have on, the, on, a, on a jury verdict, for example, or on a settlement in, in, uh, uh, in court. But it's not that big a deal because the liens, first of all, they're going to have trouble even proving their liens. Uh, the Department of Veterans Affairs, the, the veterans hospitals, whatever, if they come in and try to prove up a lien, uh, first of all, they don't keep financial records. Uh, and they'd have to come in and prove up the value. And then at the end of the day, we always settle those things in all litigation, as you know, we settle those things at five to five or ten percent uh ten percent on the dollar so it's not unusual that we'll settle if they got a, a ten thousand uh hundred thousand dollar medical lien we'll settle it for ten thousand dollars or something uh, uh, like that so that's not that big a deal but it's nice to know there's no lien uh now i want you to listen i'm gonna read this to you because i um uh, i want you to hear it clearly Neither this guidance document nor the mere existence of the EO confers any rights or constitutes an offer of settlement. Okay, so understand this is not a settlement offer. Um, so if you hear uh, if you hear the ads running that the Department of Navy has just offered to settle Camp Lejeune, no, they haven't. What they've done is they've created a grid that is very limited to a very few people. Uh, and then, uh, okay, so the overview is you have to file, you have to file an admin administrative claim. And the things that they look at, they review to decide about the value of your, uh, of your claim. They only look at the type of injury that you allege and the amount of time the claimant worked for or resided at Camp Lejeune. You got that? To evaluate your case, to decide how much your case is worth, they don't consider physical pain, mental anguish, physical disability, physical disfigurement, damage to wage earning capacity, loss of wages, economic loss, medical bills, they don't consider any of that, which is what the whole litigation is all about. That's what damages are in court. That's what damages are in the whole system of justice. They say, no, we want to know what injury you allege, and then how much time did you spend at Camp Lejeune? The time at Camp Lejeune has nothing to do with your injury except that you have to meet the 30-day minimum. Now, it says, and this is the other thing, and we're going to go back to our two examples. It says, this EO will provide settlement offers, similar settlement offers to claimants with similar exposures and injuries for which there is similar scientific evidence of causation. Now, you heard me describe to you two kidney disease cases. Now, did those two kidney disease cases sound like they have the same value for settlement purposes? Well, actually, uh, they don't. They don't have the same value for settlement purposes. But uh, because what they're offering 
and this is on their grid. What they're offering is if you have a tier one qualifying injury, uh, it's if your the time factor is your camp is you between 30 days and, le- and more than 30 days and less than a year, your qualifying injury is $150,000. Um, if you are a tier one, it's uh, their tier one, it's $150,000. If you're their tier two, uh, then it's only $100,000. Now, if you're there for uh, five, more than five years, then it's they. It would be four hundred fifty thousand, based on based strictly on the time at the base. Our tier two would be four hundred thousand. So in our case, the the kidney disease that we talked about is a tier two under their evaluation. So here's what happens there. On our master sergeant, who went through all of that, uh, all the uh, dialysis and the heart, I mean, the lung transplant and everything else, and just massive physical pain, mental anguish and so forth. He's a tier two case. So his, uh, his time at Camp Lejeune was less than a year. So he his his case is evaluated. He would get if he got this if he took this EO thing. His case is evaluated at one hundred thousand dollars. The the other gentleman who spent six years at Camp Lejeune and then only had two months of pain, only realized he had end stage renal failure for two months, so it was didn't have very much mental anguish, physical pain, none of the uh, other things. Uh, His case is evaluated at $400,000. So think about the two examples I gave you. The one with all, I mean, massive, that's that's a seven-figure case. That's a seven-figure case. All that pain and suffering, mental anguish, physical disability, and so forth. He gets a hundred thousand dollars. The other guy who had only two months of knowledge that he had end stage renal failure gets four hundred thousand dollars. That's how this grid works. Um, so the that's that's the the lack of equity that involves when the only thing you consider are you a tier one or a tier two under their standard and how long were you at Camp Lejeune? And what, what uh, injury do you have? And how long were you at Camp Lejeune? So I think that pretty much illustrates the legitimacy of this of this offer. Let me tell you why the, it's not an offer of this grid. But let me tell you why they did this. They Number one, they uh, wanted to show the court that they're doing something pertaining to uh, the settlement. They want to be able to tell the court that, Judge, we're trying to settle. We have, we've created a grid from which we can work towards settlement with our Tier 1 victims. Okay, that's the first thing. to get the, So they have something to tell the judge when the judge says, how many cases have you settled? Well, we haven't settled any yet, but we've created a grid. Uh, the second thing is they're, they're putting out a uh, representational figure. Uh, right now, it, you have to, they're trying to get into the mind of the public and especially into the mind of the people who are, uh, like you, the people who are the, the survivors, and and have these diseases, they're trying to inject into your mind what these cases may be worth. So this is called a reference point. So they're trying to create a reference point of $100,000 or $150,000. Or maybe if you were there five years, $300,000.
and you have a tier one, or maybe $450,000. But they're trying to change the reference point because the reference point right now, when you talk to focus groups about this, when you talk to, uh, to, our, to our clients about this, the reference point right now is a million dollars. It's more than, it's a, it's a seven figure case, not a million, but the reference point, people think of these things as being seven figure cases. So they're trying to get the public from stopping thinking about this and especially they want to get you to stop thinking about this as a seven figure case. So they've given you a new reference point. Now, now they want you to believe that the evaluation on this is a hundred thousand. Was that your evaluation when you heard the sergeants to, I told you sit as a juror? Was that your evalu evaluation when I told you think about what a juror, what was your award as a juror to this sergeant? Was it a hundred thousand dollars? That's what he gets under their grid. So it's the change of a reference point from 100 to four to 450. And then if you I can add death onto it, they add $100,000 for death. And as I say, I have to say this again, because I, <laughs> I can't believe it. I have to reassure myself this is true. In evaluating your case, if you accept an EO, they are not considering physical pain, mental anguish, physical disability, physical disfigurement, damage to wage earn capacity, wage loss, uh, medical bills, and uh, the uh, the pharmaceutical and, and the death, the cause of death, the, the whole fact that you're uh, that you're not with us anymore, uh, or how many how many beneficiaries did you leave? How many people are relying on you for support at the time of your death? And they're not considering any of those things, which is the whole body of damages. That's what damages are under our United States system of, just, of justice. Uh, they've created a new one. It's how long were you at Camp Lejeune? So the next thing, they have a grid and the grid is they, they're using the grid and the grid is the same as ours, except I've already showed you what their grid was. Their grid is the first five are the same. The ones I have that showed you were sufficient. And the tier two are the other four. Tier two are multiple myeloma, Parkinson's, kidney disease, and stage renal failure, and uh, systemic sclerosis and scleroderma. So those are tier two. Everything else is tier one. Uh, now, they did an interesting thing. They, in our tier one, is cardiac birth defects. And they just say, well, cardiac birth defects are not included in the EO. They won't settle that one with you. Even though the ATSDR determined there was sufficient evidence of causation. Cardiac birth defects include a wide range of illnesses that are difficult to evaluate similarly without fact-intensive investigation. So they don't want to take the trouble of ev evaluating the individual case. And they're too different to put the same cheap stamp on every one of them. So they're just going to ignore it completely. Um, now, you have to have exposure uh, of ex at least 30 days. I have to be in there not less than 30 days. Uh, and then... The duration of exposure is based on your residential and occupational exposure for claimants who worked at the base. Uh, and the, uh, the base is defined as <laughs> the Camp Lejeune, as including both the Marine Corps base Camp Lejeune, the main base, and the Marine Corps Air Station at New River. We have several clients from New River also, so that we, that's the same as the regular cases. Um, the claimants with diseases that ATSDR uh, ha are, have a stronger case, it, the longer you were at the base. Uh, it's just not simply true that if you, if you have exposure in your first 60 days, and that's enough exposure to give you cancer, your cancer is not going to be worse if you stayed there five years. You got cancer and you die. You're going to be just as dead after 30 days exposure 
as you were after five years. And the, I mean, they're just trying to manufacture this whole idea and make it the criterion. They can't win on the regular criterion. They'll get killed on on all the pain, on all general damages as it's been as it's been followed in England and the United States for centuries. They can't live with that, so they got to create their own. So we'll say, well, it's how how long are you at Camp Lejeune? Well, that's what you're buying into if you buy into the uh, EO uh, their EO uh, grid. Um, the the, the requirements that you have with respect to the to the administrative claim, you have to present your case to, to, to the Navy. Uh, you have to show a latency period of how long the latency was on your disease. In other words, you're exposed to the you're exposed to the disease in uh, in, in, in 85 and you didn't but it didn't manifest and, uh, until uh, 2005, and so you're 20 years later. You got a 20 year manifestation because of latency. So what they're saying is your latency can't be less than two years. It has to be more than two years between your exposure and and when it became obvious that you had the disease. But it can't be greater than 35 years. There's just there's no reason for that. I mean, that's not that that will cover most things, but it doesn't cover everything. But that's just something else they put in. So your latency has to be more than more than uh, two years and less than 35. So evidentiary standards. You know, this is not this is not going to be simple. The evidentiary standards uh, that let's say a pro se uh, marine tries to tries to handle in this case. Uh, to show a qualifying injury, you must have medical documentation showing that the claimant was diagnosed or treated for that illness before August 10th. Medical documentation must be signed or certified. Listen to this. Appropriate medical documentation may include medical records, treatment notes, test results, billing records, death certificates, or a letter from a medical doctor. Medical documentation must be signed or certified by a medical doctor. So if you just get medical records, you get medical records with operative report or diagnostic report, and it says, the diagnostic report says you have multiple myeloma. The surgery for multiple myeloma, that's not, you give them that medical record, you give them operative reports, that's not enough. That, that medical record must be certified signed or certified by a medical doctor. Also, medical documentation must be original. Uh, I'm sure the hospital is going to give you the originals or certified copies of the originals. So if you get medical records from the hospital, good luck on getting this from the VA. Uh, you get medical records from the hospital, those medical records have to be certified as copies. Uh, and so it's it's ridiculous. I mean, it's hard enough to get medical re records anyway, but then to have a doctor sign them, uh, I mean, considering that the doctor's been dead for 15 years, um, is, is just another, and they just build in these hurdles on here. Um, you can use your uh, housing or employment documentation uh, to establish your duration of exposure, how long you were at this certain location. Uh, you can uh, you can also use, to prove that you were there, you can use military service records, tax returns, driver's license, so forth. Now, uh, or similar documentation. But listen to this. Here's how they, here's how they increase the burden of proof for people that want to do this. Um, the... Uh, you, for purposes of EO secondary evidence, such as a sworn affidavit statement or declaration, is not sufficient to show that you resided at Camp Lejeune because such evidence is less reliable. So in the lawsuit, you simply testify that I lived at Camp Lejeune and had not point. Uh, I lived there for a year and a half. I lived there from this date to this date. And that's evidence. 
and that's sufficient evidence. But they're taking that out. They're saying you can't use that. You can't give an affidavit. You're going to have to go back and, and get some documentation that proves that you lived at Head Knot Point during that period of time. So that's an increased burden over what we have to do to analysts in a lawsuit. Uh, and they got some they got some tricky stuff in here. Um, the now they do say you may rely on VA benefits uh, to establish a qualifying injury uh, and a duration of exposure uh, uh, between thirty and uh, three hundred sixty four days. Um, and then for death, you have to have the extended death certificate and so forth, or a letter signed by the uh, doctor. Now, the process for reviewing administrative claims, this is a little, this is a, could be a little tricky. They say step one is that to determine perfection. An administrative claim must be, be presented uh, in order to satisfy the presentment requirement. Uh, so what happens is in the administrative claim, you go in, you present your, you present your, your claim. And then they review your claim. And then when they finish reviewing your claim and find it to be sufficient, they will give you a letter of perfection. Now, they're talking about determining here perfection. Uh, and then that's an important word, perfection. Then it says, that step two, screen perfected, perfected claims for a qualifying injury. So how they, the way these things start is they go in and look and see, do you have a, uh, first of all, do you have a perfected claim? And it does that perfected claim include a qualifying injury? Let me tell you what's wrong with that. The other thing about perfected, the Department of Navy shall investigate perfected administrative claims uh, for all this to and so forth. What's wrong with that is this. The process is you file your claim, they review your claim, and then they give you a letter of perfection. You now have a perfected claim. Now, I can go in and file a claim, and at the, at the end of six months, I have they have 180 days, and at the end of six months, if they have not denied my claim, I can be deemed to be denied and move on out. Now, Here's the trick. In that period of time, they did not give me a letter of perfection. Why? Because the letter of perfection takes more. They're so far behind on them, it always takes more than six months. So you move in, you wait your 180 days, and then you move out. You don't have a letter of perfection. And at the last time I looked at it, they were eight months behind on letters of perfection, not that they were taking eight months to do one, but they were taking, they were eight months beyond that. They were eight, eight months beyond, beyond, uh, beyond it. So, and that's uh, before they get you a letter of perfection. So you might be over there 14 months uh, and not have a letter of perfection. You might be, you're certainly going to be there. Uh, you're certainly going to be there more. They don't issue letters of perfection within six months. They just don't. And most people who are doing this with big masses are moving on after six months. So then if they're going to go back and use, uh, use perfection as a standard for review, most of us won't have one. Mo I don't, I have so few letters of perfection, if any, and we've, we've got lots of cases go through there and we never get a letter of perfection because we move on out in six months. So a lot of this may fall on its face if they're going to require perfection and the perfection, there is no perfection. You don't have a letter of perfection in the file. So that may fall on their face, but okay. Um, the, now they're saying if, if you are, if you're in court now, if you're already in court, can you, can you take advantage of this, uh, the CEO? And the answer is, uh, Essentially, it's no, but then they have because you have to be. It has to be done at the Navy level, and the Navy does not have the authority to investigate you once you leave Navy JAG. 
uh, they can't investigate you when you're in court. So, so the the uh, the DOJ came up with an alternative method, and they say, okay, if you are in court and you want to you want this EO opportunity, we're going to have what we call uh, a class A, and it's going to be that you're that the the in certain circumstances, the Department of Justice will review your claim to see if it qualifies. We'll do all the things that Navy should have done. And then if you qualify, you know, we can put you through, put you into that class and, and move you on in that fashion. So technically, there is a way uh, that, uh, that you can do that. Um, so they review all this stuff. They, they look for perfected claims. They review it. They determine, do you have a, a uh, tier one disease? Uh, do you qualify under all uh, the other little goodies? And then they say, okay, uh, they may, then they will mail an offer to you or your lawyer. And then you have 60 days to accept or decline an offer under the EO. Uh, if you accept it, then you're going through, uh, and then you have 14 days to execute the releases and so forth. And then you go over to the judgment fund and you get paid. If you reject it, um, you will, um, then you can just go right back into your regular claim um, and, uh, and just put, process that on through. Uh, you cannot come back, once you reject it, you cannot come back for a second bite of the apple uh, on the EO. Uh, now, one of the other things is, in the EO, you can only, you can have, I've got clients with three tier one cases, three tier one diseases. And, and, and you, can, you can prove that up. When you're proving up your misery, your pain and suffering, your mental anguish, when you have three tier one diseases, uh, that they get to take all that into account in establishing the damages. In this case, in the EO, you are you may recover only for one injury. So if you have several things wrong, uh, you pick the highest one that you qualify for, and that's the only one you get. So you're stuck with 100 or 150 or whatever you qualify for. Um, you. The people that accept the EO <laughs> can expect to receive payment within 60 days. Um, the, uh, and then they, they have a bunch of things saying, well, you're so much better off with us. Um, they say you can either decline an EO and push on through, or you can file your lawsuit. Um, and uh, then, uh, what other questions are there? Uh, yes, it applies to claims and litigation. Um, on, the, on the balance, the ATSDR assessment of the evidence provides a principled, I would dispute that, it provides a principled basis for settling cases in the administrative claim phase. They actually had the temerity to say that. Uh, so they're retired. They're, they're replacing the entire damages system in U.S. jurisprudence with the amount of time you spend at Camp Lejeune, but that's a principled basis for settling cases. Um, the, let's see what else is they made. Yeah, and they make the argument that, yeah, they're all the same, but, uh, you know, why not? Um, assessing the severity of an injury is fact-intensive and time-consuming. It's way too much trouble for us. Uh, assigning different values to different types of illnesses based on their severity may be inappropriate, you think, uh, at the administrative claim phase because of the inherent complexity of such an assessment. Uh, third, the qualifying injuries are nearly all cancers or other terminal or chronic illnesses. So if they're all cancers, then obviously they're all worth the same thing. And that's somewhere between 150 and 
$450, may as well be um, The only other thing, uh, the attorney's fees, uh, what percentage of my EO payment may be collected as attorney's fees? The answer to that is it's, uh, it's contractual. It's whatever you've contracted with your attorney for. Um, and finally, the EO offer will not affect your veterans' benefits. So that's that is the uh, you can see it's not a it's not a settlement offer. Uh, what it is is a it's a grid that they're hoping. The third reason they did it was they hope that there are people who are uh, who are so in debt. So in, so financially destitute that they'll accept this settlement, or there are people who come in and try to do it pro se, who will accept it because they have no idea uh, how much money they're leaving on the table. Uh, okay, that's all I know about this. Except I might have uh, room for some answers. Um, Brittany, I have a problem on my screen. It's showing the original Zoom and it won't, I can't see the screen. Let me see. And I can't get off of it and I need to get back on the other one. Let's Can you minimize whatever is popping up? Yeah, the Zoom, the, the Zoom cover page. Uh, you try to minimize that? Now it's trying to put me, there I go. It's trying to put me into a different Zoom as well. saying, okay, I got it. All right, let me see if I've got time. Uh, well, you know, they, okay. There's some good questions in here. So let me, let me go through these quickly. I, I don't want to get too case specific. I need to talk. I need to answer questions that apply to everybody. But uh, here's one that I've said myself. Uh, what could be the possible financial uh, amount awarded for a miscarriage, um, and so you have to you have to think in terms of okay, now what is my damage? What is my damage proof going to be? Uh, if you have a a woman who was at uh, be she a marine or be she the spouse of a serving marine, uh, and she has a she drinks the water and she has a miscarriage. Uh, in 1975, uh, so you get you get to trial on it now, and then what what damage proof are you going to make uh, for the loss of a for the miscarriage that occurred 50 years ago? Uh, so that's going to be a tough. That's going to be a tough, uh, a tough thing to put up in terms of legal damages that the jury would believe. But okay, um, Brittany would like to answer this question. Okay, go ahead, Brittany. No, I was just marking it that we were answering it live. Okay, uh, how will we be notified if our case is in line for settlement? Well, if you'll know. Uh, your case will be, at some point, will be evaluated for settlement. There's no question that everything, every case is going to be evaluated for settlement. But you'll know if your case is, is in line for settlement. Uh, first of all, you will have been pulled out and told, okay, you've got to answer these interrogatories. You've got to give your deposition. Uh, we have to prepare you for, um, uh, well, that's if you're, if you're uh, in line, if you're in line for settlement or trial, if you're in line for trial, you will be told that you're a bellwether case and you got to get ready for trial. Uh, if if not, then all all cases will be in line for settlement. We're gonna we're gonna we're gonna set we settle each case based upon individual uh, based upon individual evaluations. Um, after we do a matrix, sorry if we don't. And I told you there's several different ways you can do it. You can do evaluations. Um, the 
the question is if my if the it, it's a deceased case, what should we prepare? How do we prepare the situation damages of our father? Okay, first of all, the administrator, you have to have an administrator of his estate. And then the administrator of the state just goes through and do, does exactly what he would have done. He files a claim as the administrator, and then he just follows the whole thing through as the administrator, filing a lawsuit as administrator and so forth. Uh, the first thing you do is uh, turn the whole thing over to your lawyer. Um, but, okay, so the miscarriage is not a tier one case. Um, Well, we, the question is what everybody wants to know, and that's uh, <clears throat> how long is this going to how long is this going to last? Right now, with the cooperation of the judges, which we have, hell, Judge Bull told us he wants to try the first case in October. Hello, <laughs> uh, we would do. Uh, I think what's going to happen. By the time we get the entire Bellwether case set up, which we're doing right now, and we start moving people through that Bellwether system, uh, we can start providing, we can start pushing people into Bellwethers um, quickly. And I think, I think we can do, I think we will have trials by Q1 of next year. And when, when trials start, we're looking at the Bellwether Committee we're looking at having to have not a, not a bellwether case ready for trial. We're looking at, at having uh, 15, 20, 30, 40 cases ready for trial at one time. Because if all four of the judges say, okay, uh, on the first week in January, we each want to try uh, a case. We each want that first thing on our docket. So you got four bellwether cases. So then they say, okay, uh, we got time after that to try a second one that week. So, and they can do that. They're two, two days each. So we could have first week in January, we want eight trials. Um, and then the next week, we want eight trials. Let's get on with this. And we have to be ready to push <laughs> four trials at a time through the system and another four the same week. So we're <clears throat> what we're trying to do right now is we're we're at the point right now where we are we're just sending out a memo to lawyers who have cases on file, and that's mostly us. I mean, most of the cases that are on file are in our group, so we're sending we're looking in our own dockets and saying, okay, on the cases that are on file, we'll push forward. We'll we'll create a document that describes the case. And then it'll come to the Bellwether Committee, and then we'll start pushing them. And then once we once we get them through, it's an ongoing process. We'll be pushing cases through Bellwethers, just one after another, after another, after another, until this is over. Now, this isn't going to be like most cases where you pick you pick five Bellwethers and you're through. This is going to be a perpetual Bellwether situation until the judges say stop. So. Uh, I think I think we'll have the judges will be ready to go. I think we'll be ready to go. I think we'll have the first trials in the first quarter of next year. Uh, let's see. <clears throat> okay. Yes, the on a death case. Yes, you still have. You still have the uh, survival action. The question is, uh, if you have a death case, will will they still be able to prove up all the bad things that happened to them uh, from the kidneys uh, during life? The answer is yes. That is a survival action, and the administrator can prosecute the survival action, and that's the claim that the decedent would have had had he lived. Uh, the wrongful death case is the claim of the uh, statutory beneficiaries of the of the decedent for their loss. Um, uh, the you won't know. The question is, when will we know exactly where our case is located? Well, 
you won't you won't know, and it doesn't really matter because unless you're a bellwether case, uh, and if you're a bellwether case, you'll be notified. Uh, when <clears throat> your cases after they go through Navy JAG, they're just going to sit there waiting for the settlement process to work until they go into the court system. We do not want 100,000 cases in court. We got 2,000 cases in court right now, and that is enough. We do not want 100,000 cases filed in the district court. The Department of Justice wouldn't have time to do anything but, but work on answers. We want the Department of Justice free to work with us on matrices and on trials and on getting these cases ready for ready for a settlement. So or for trial or settlement. So unless you're a bellwether case, uh, you can be a tier one. Being a tier one case does not automatically make you a bellwether case. Bellwether cases are carefully vetted by yours truly and a, and a few other guys uh, to see that we're putting up the best cases we have. So you can have a bellwether case. I mean, you can have a tier one case and still not be a strong case, uh, still not be strong enough to be a bellwether. Uh, but if you're a bellwether, you'll know it because you'll be notified. Um, if I had another, I had just about another two hours I could answer these. Uh, okay, here's a question about what's coming up next. Uh, oh yeah, the problem with the VA doctor, <laughs> you know, it's difficult uh, for a VA doctor for the last three years of his life because the doctor told him to stay home. The VA is is an abomination. Uh, it's unbelievable that that's the best that we can do for our veterans in terms of service. It's absolutely the most inefficient part of a highly inefficient federal government. And it's, it's a, just an outrage. So to the extent that you're depending on the VA for anything, you start it early because it'll take forever to get it. So the question is, um, one second. Thank you for the overview. If another Zoom meeting is to occur in the future, please send the invite. Okay, so here's the deal. Here's what's gonna happen. What I tried to do today was to give you to, to, to get this to where we can now start applying this to your case so you're knowledgeable about this, so that uh, now you know what you didn't know a couple of hours ago. You know that you're being, you'll be compensated for physical pain, mental anguish, you know, all the things that we talked about. Uh, you know that your case, it, when, when you have the question, I wonder where my case is, it's either in Navy JAG or it's sitting at the door of the courthouse waiting for the terms of settlement to be worked out, or it's in the courthouse working its way through. If you are being called upon to answer interrogatories, give depositions, and that sort of thing, you're in the courthouse. You're in, you're in, you're, you're filed as one of the 2000 cases in the courthouse. Uh, if you're not, if you've already been through Navy JAG, so you're in one of those three and, and, and it doesn't matter. What, what's important is that when your case manager calls you and asks you a question and asks you to fill out this and ask you to acquire this document and that sort of thing, wherever you are, they're asking you for that because it, you have to have that in order to move to the next level. So if you're still, if you're not on file, there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, there's not, out of 450,000 cases, I hope that there are no more than maximum 3,000 cases filed. So don't worry that you're not on file at the courthouse. Uh, if, you're, if you're at the Navy JAG, uh, it doesn't matter. We're gonna wait six months and then you won't be in the Navy JAG anymore. You'll be waiting at the courthouse door. So it's, this, this whole thing is not based, it's, when you have 450,000 cases to process through, it's not about your case at that point. It becomes that about your case when you get to the end, when you've gone through the matrix and when you sat down with your attorney and the attorney goes over with you every element of your damages and then puts a dollar figure for settlement, 
and then sits down to negotiate your case. That, that's when that's when you personally uh, become extremely important in the case because we can't get that information from anybody else. So remember when you're when you're uh, case manager, each one of you has a case manager assigned to your case, specifically to your case. They're the people that communicate with you. They call you. They also have a lawyer assigned to your case who also works with the case manager. The lawyer tells them, call the client and ask him about what doctors they saw. We need, we're missing that. The case manager calls you. You need to, you need to cooperate with them and give them that information. They go, they take it back to the lawyer. The lawyer plugs it in wherever he's working. He's, if he's working at Navy JAG level or if he's working at the, at the court level, he needs that information. He wouldn't be asking it for you and, and you're the only place to get it. So you are, you're extremely important at every level to this whole process. And, uh, and so let me tell you what I'm, I'm going to have to do. I'll stay on this. It's 1230, but I'll stay on this. But uh, let me tell you what we're going to do, what the plan is. Um, I, I've been doing this with focus groups since, uh, since we passed the bill last year. Uh, we've done a, several focus groups because we're testing jurors in North Carolina. So we know what they think about these cases. And we test, we, we test the cases uh, with focus groups. And then I do another thing, which I find to be very helpful. And, and I'll, I'll do this with you. I've been doing focus groups where, where I'll get several uh, of one uh, injury together. Uh, I'll have, uh, for example, I'll get all of the leukemia cases together. Uh, and I'll, I'll get maybe, we'll choose like 20 of them. And, and then we'll put those 20 on in a, in a Zoom call like this with me. And then it's just me and 20 people with leukemia. And so we have an open discussion about what is your pain and suffering? What's your mental life? What kind of problems are you having? What are all the things that are going on with you about that as a result of you having leukemia? How has this affected your life? And and we and then we let them. This is a beautiful part of this. These twenty people get to talking among themselves. I mean, it's an open forum. I'm not. It's not a question and answer. It's not a lecture. It's an open forum. So I'll have an open forum with twenty leukemia patients. And I'll learn more than you can imagine about leukemia patients that you know that you can't that you can't know without without having it. And and so what we're going to do now, I'm I'm, I'm continuing to do that uh, with each with each of the tier one diseases. The what I'm going to do now is I'm going to start doing more specific. Like this, I'll do updates every now and then like this where I bring everybody up to date. But I'm also going to uh, do this where I bring uh, I bring in uh, all of the multiple myeloma people and have a discussion with them uh, on a on, like this, have a discussion with them, more of a lecture series about here's what you should be looking for. Here's what here's what here's the status of expert witnesses, here's the status of our science, and so forth, just to bring them up to date, and then also to learn from them about what we should be doing uh, to enhance their claim on multiple myeloma. And so the, the, you might see the next one of these might be just go out to all of the kidney cancer cases, patients. That's, that's, our largest, that's our largest number, largest volume of cases we have is kidney cancer. So I might do the next one on this, uh, just on kidney cancer, and do it for an hour. And then we'll just bring everybody up who has kidney cancer specifically up to date on what that case is all about. And I might, what I might do is to have a three-hour conference like this, and I'll do one hour on kidney cancer with the kidney cancer people, one hour on the non-Hodgkin lymphoma people, one hour on the liver cancer people, just so you, you get more more specific information about the science and and the status of everything in your case right now. 
so that's how I plan to proceed. Then periodically, at least once a month, I'll be doing one of these, which is trying to bring everybody up to date. And, and we post a lot of this. It, it, keep up with our website. We post a lot of this on our website. You know, we have a special website. And we're going to, for example, this, this whole thing here will be posted on our website in the next couple of days. Uh, where do you put this, Brittany, on the... Where, where, where should they go to look for this or look for our updates on our website? Okay. So we have the www.justiceforveterans.info. Now, .info is where we post all this, uh, where we post specific info. We do updates. We do articles. I write an article every month for our Trial Lawyer magazine uh, about with an update on uh, uh, it, on campus. You know, I give them an update every month in Trial Lawyer magazine, and then we post that on Justice for Veterans info. I give a lot of speeches on this to lawyers, and then we'll post our speeches on different aspects, on different topics on this on there and then we can turn and then we do sometimes we do uh we'll do a uh, a special presentation with just me and dave winter that we just record for the benefit of everybody and then we'll put that up there so keep up with what's going on on uh www.justiceforveterans.info we post everything we do up there and so that's the best place to go for the immediate immediate information um, update and then we'll we'll notify you every time we do uh, every time we do one of these but we'll be doing this the general generic one we'll be doing this uh, once uh, once a month at least so um, I think that's it that's 12 35 uh, you've you've given away two hours of your uh, of your weekend, and I hope that uh, I hope it's been beneficial to you. So best of luck to you. You know we're in there, uh, and uh, we're in there fighting for you. And we, I got I'll tell you one more thing. We have a terrific, terrific leadership team. I've been involved in mass torts uh, for many, many years, and I've worked with a lot of mass tort teams, and we we handpick these. And our mass tort leadership team is tremendous. It is absolutely tremendous. So you are very, very well represented uh, in this litigation. And remember, uh, your lawyer that brought me into this is still is still here working, and 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 we're all we're all doing everything we can to get the justice you deserve. Uh, so have a great weekend, and thanks for tuning in.